Let's welcome Billy Arrow. It's a pleasure to be here. Uh, thank you all for coming out tonight. <laughs> I'm going to uh, alternate poems from uh, my new book, Blasphemer, and from uh, Pointed Census. This is called Centuries of Falling. I am falling, falling out of my body, falling like snow into a new volcano. I am falling, falling out of my body, falling like midnight onto mice. I am falling, falling out of my body, falling like sand into the wet hair of the world. I am falling, falling out of my body, falling like raindrops onto tiny sprockets of light. I am falling, falling out of my body, falling like sugar into God's hot caffeine. Uh, and this is from a uh, point of sentence, it's called Need. I knew I needed to visit a beach made entirely of shark's teeth. And on that beach, I knew I would find ivory binoculars left by a vegan birder. And with those binoculars, I knew I could see into the windows of a shoreline luncheonette. And in that luncheonette, I knew I'd find my step uncle propositioning a leggy waitress. And I thought of my aunt, her failing eyes, a thousand miles away on a dirty beach looking for signs of onyx-colored birds. And I knew I had to visit that beach, for I too wanted to see those birds, and I had the binoculars necessary. And this one is called End of Shift. He fell back against the pillows, inert as a noble gas. I watched his body weave in and out of delirium. I listened to it suck all the sleep out of the tired air. He was losing his fight with malaria, but you would never know it from his dreams, which were fierce and fearless, ruddy and red, in which all the weapons were drawn, all poised to clash. He was fighting the bees, who had the heads of lobsters and bellowed like mittens in the microwave. Against them was the Yakuza, in league with the Mariana Trench, Italian circus clowns wearing emerald ties bubbled up from the pork pie deep and made snipping sounds as they broke the surface of Migrant Bay. The agricultural fair was interrupted by an invasion of piebald workmen with stalks of corn growing out of their backs. His body heaved arrhythmically. Was I watching him die or recover? I couldn't tell. Ten minutes more and I was done for the day. Someone else may witness the Rai de Numa. I will be miles away where the porous walls are covered in bituminous cheese, where the scorpion clocks are drawing the water for their velveteen candle baths. Uh, and this one is called, uh, uh, this one is called uh, Axis. You think about the first time you saw an ax. You're in your father's workshop. You think about the first time you held an ax. An older man warned you not to cut off your own leg. You think about the first time you sharpened an ax. You held the sharpening stone in your fist. Then you read Aristotle. Poetry is an ax. Poetry is an ax. Then you remembered. The first time you saw a poem. The first time you held a poem. The first time you sharpened a poem. The first time a poem sharpened you. Uh, and this one is called Paris in the, the Spring. He thought of her urgently, as one might recall the occasion of a prayer. She thought of him absently, as one might recall the color of a bus. He thought of her excitedly, as one might recall the orange of a bird. She thought of him painfully, as one might recall the stiffness of a joint. He thought of her longingly, as one might recall the kindness of a bed. She thought of him fearfully, as one might recall the onset of a storm. This one is called, uh, Love and How It Gets That Way. You were the most beautiful girl in third grade. 
My thoughts were restless escapades. My heart was roasted butter. I donned wax wings and flew toward the highest sky I could find. And then among a score of others to be invited to your party. We all stood on the lawn behind your house, most of us in wide striped tees, and one of us in a bow tie, eyeing that thing in your backyard, that thing you pumped to spin around. And we all took turns. You on one side in a yellow dress, and one after the other of us on the other. And we spun you, spun you. And then that kid in the bow tie got on, got dizzy and vomited. And you looked at him with disgust. And I felt like Adam's apple had just landed in my lap. This poem is called Departure, Arrival, and Return. One, departure. I am leaving my body to science for a while for another woman. I am leaving on a jet plane. I am leaving in the morning. I am leaving for parts unknown. I am leaving, but the fighter still remains. I am taking off on my own, in my own way, leaving the door unlocked, leaving the dog in the car. I am leaving for Las Vegas. I am leaving Las Vegas. I am leaving for pastures new. Two, arrival. I have arrived. Will you look at this place? The clouds are leaning on the sky like winos against the thalia. The birds dot the bare trees like ringworm on a cow. The sun is resting on the hill like the final drop of Thomas Hardy's blood. Three, return. I have come back, and my bones are delighted to see me. I encircle the bakery. I embrace my barber. I endorse my bank. I am so happy to walk these wizened streets, to sup from the civic trough, to race my horse again around the calcified church. Put down your bazooka, Marianne. Like rusting sumac to the staghorn aphid, I've come serenely home. Um, and uh, this poem uh, is uh, called uh, Hard Crane Pantoom uh, Number One, and it appears in the recent uh, issue of Rhino. Um, and uh, Pantoom is a, uh, a form in which there are repetitions of, uh, of certain lines in, uh, uh, in subsequent stanzas. Um, but this particular poem is formed from lines from the letters of Hard Crane uh, that I've uh, taken uh, to a book in public domain and that uh, I've uh, just assembled into a pantoon. So this is it. Oh, Gorm, I have known moments in eternity. My satisfactions are far more remote and dangerous than yours. Life is too scattered for me to savor it anymore. Your figure haunts me like a kind of affectionate caress. My satisfactions are far more remote and dangerous than yours. Oh God, that I should have to live within these American restrictions. Your figure haunts me like a kind of affectionate caress. Meditation on the sun is all there is. Oh God, that I should have to live within these American restrictions. The imagination is the only thing worth a damn. Meditation on the sun is all there is. Let us invent an idiom for the proper tra transposition of jazz into words. The imagination is the only thing worth a damn. I pass my goggle-eyed father on the streets. Let us invent an idiom for the proper transposition of jazz into words. My writing is hard to cipher. I pass my goggle-eyed father on the streets. That funeral was one of the few beautiful things that have happened to me in Cleveland. My writing is hard deciphering. Oh, if you knew how much I am learning. That funeral was one of the few beautiful things that have happened to me in Cleveland. One must be drenched in words. Oh, if you knew how much I am learning. Let us write occasionally and be as metropolitan as possible. One must be drenched in words. Life is too scattered for me to savor it anymore. Let's write occasionally and be as metropolitan as possible. Oh, Gorm, I have known moments in eternity. Um, and I'm just going to finish with uh, two others. 
Um, these are two poems that uh, have some connection to the book of Job. Uh, the title in this one comes from Job, and the last two lines also come from Job. And this is called, He Spreadeth Sharp Pointed Things Upon the Mire. My uncle looks into the bleached eye of his cat and asks, what happened to my ear? The mere cat's eye replies, you had cancer, remember? They had to cut off your ear to save you. My uncle looks into the smudged window of his oven and asks, what happened to Maud? The sundered oven replies, she had cancer, remember? They had to cut her out of your body to save you. My uncle looks into the blistered photo montage and asks, where's Colin? He'll be late for the swim meet. The designer frame replies, he had cancer, remember? They had to cut him out of your hopes to save you. My uncle looks into his aluminum shaving mirror and says, why did they want to save me? I didn't want to be saved. The dented mirror replies, who clothed the horse's neck with thunder? Who can discover the garment of his face? This last one is uh, also uh, taken from Job. Um, and a lot of the lines in it come from Job. I won't tell you all the different lines, but I can show you later if you want. Um, and this is called Blackish by Reason of the Ice. And that's from Job. I was in the basement. In the basement with Sarah, who was reading Job to the baby. I was in the basement thinking about Uncle Kermit's terrible black tie, 100% polyester which you wore to the funeral last Tuesday. I was in the basement with Sarah, whose eyes were eyes of flesh, whose eyes were like the eyelids of mourning, who had made a covenant with mine eyes. And I said to her, Sarah, do you taketh it with your eyes? And she said, what? And I said, do you taketh it with your eyes? And she said, stop being stupid. Can you hold the baby? And I said, I had not been as infants, which never saw light. And she said, sharpening her eyes upon me, take the fucking baby. <laughs> and I took the baby, and I rocked the baby, and the baby rocked me. And as I comforted my son, and as my son comforted me, I remembered they called Edward Dahlberg the Job of American letters because he suffered in his art. Many there are who work hard and suffer neglect. All Job's? Sarah, I called. Do you take it with your eyes? But she was lost, lost in the text, and heard me not. And then, for just a moment, I too felt lost, like a child, like someone who meets with darkness in the daytime and gropes in the midday as in the night. Of course, I knew we cannot order our speech by reason of darkness alone. Any more than Uncle Kermit could have worn a different tie to the wake. For life is wind, and death is astonishment. Sarah, I implored, take the baby, for he hath made me weary. And Sarah took the baby with her eyes. Thank you.